begin this day with the acknowledgement that this conference is being held on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. I am an urban planner, not an events planner. This is my daily affirmation. <laughs> but seriously, in my coursework as an undergraduate and then as a graduate, and then as a planner studying for my AICP exam, I was reminded time and again about the contribution public health has made to the planning profession. Yay, public health. <laughs> but today, and to our mutual detriment, these two disciplines often inhabit separate worlds. This is not so in Vancouver. And the many trips of Dr. Patrick Daly, who you're going to be hearing from shortly, her many trips to City Hall is one way that Vancouver is different. Wait a minute. Public health goes to City Hall, and City Hall wants to hear what public health has to say? Oh my god, this is amazing, right? <coughs> but like I said, things here are different. Uh, so this morning, before our first speaker and our panel, we are going to do a short assessment about what your communities are doing on public health. And I hope this exercise inspires you to expect more from your community and, and more from City Hall and, and more from your health professionals. Uh, I hope it inspires aspirations and not your ire as, as the city of Vancouver is somehow the smart kid in the class who's going off the curve for everybody else and making them look inferior. So, uh, on to our self-assessment. Back to our first question. When was the last time your public health officer visited City Hall? First question. When was the last time your public health officer talked to the media about spending more money on transit, walking, and bicycling? Third question. Has your health department ever sent 30 people to an active transportation conference? <laughs> Does your health department have 30 people? <laughs> As a side note, I did some check-in this morning, and the city of Vancouver, while it has a very impressive footprint here of planners and designers and engineers, is outnumbered by the health professionals in the crowd. Pretty cool, right? And lastly, does your health department strategic plan include such goals as 50% of daily trips made by foot, biking, and transit? Well, they're already there. All residents living within a five minute walk to a park by 2020. And by park, we don't mean the sad little piece of lawn that's out in front of this hotel. <laughs> true fact, true fact. That is a public space and it was created as a concession so the hotel could get a density bonus. So that is a public space. Uh, and I dare you, I dare you, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. I dare you to sit, stand, roll around, have a picnic, eat a sandwich, whatever, on that grass. <laughs> Back to our strategic plan and our self-assessment. And homelessness. Does your city's public health strategic plan have that in it? Reduce poverty by 75%. Raise median income by 3% per year, increased voter participation by 25%. And have everybody who has at least four people who they can count on in a time of a crisis. How's that for an expansive definition of health? <laughs> oh, and one more thing. And this one isn't fair. Does your city have somebody like Dr. Patty Daly? who is the Chief Medical Health Officer of Vancouver Coastal Health, who is working to honor the following promise, that Vancouverites have not only the right to a healthy environment, but have equitable access to livable environments, equitable access to so everybody, access to livable environments in which they can thrive. Thank you, Mark. And first of all, lots of 
cities have uh, medical health officers like me, so uh, I hope I can live up to that introduction, but I want to reassure you that Vancouver is not alone in, in working with their local public health officials. However, I am very proud of the work that we have done with the city on the Healthy City Strategy, and uh, I hope all of you will take the opportunity to go to the City of Vancouver website to learn more about the strategy. Uh, you'll find that it's highly ambitious, as Mark alluded to. It has 13 goals uh, with targets set for 2025, um, and they address uh, uh, those underlying determinants of health that those of us who work in public health are, are, know are so important uh, for health and well-being. Things like poverty reduction, ensuring people have a place to live, early childhood development. It, it addresses some of the risk factors that we know are so important uh, for chronic disease, such as physical activity, healthy eating. It even addresses the delivery of health services. Uh, we know that they, that health services are also important in overall health and well-being. They're, they play a minor role in population health is still important. So, for example, the uh, strategy, one of the goals of the strategy is that everyone has a family physician if they desire one. Uh, be, before I get into uh, some of the work that we've done in public health, I do want to give a little bit of a history. Mark alluded to, to the fact that uh, perhaps it's unusual for public health officials to come into City Hall. In fact, if we look at the history of public health, that's not the case. Uh, public health departments began in the developing world in the 19th century primarily to address some of the uh, important issues that were responsible for early um, mortality and death in urban populations. And these were primarily issues of sanitation, ensuring the provision of uh, clean drinking water, uh, sewage at the disposal, um, looking at uh, housing that, uh, that did not facilitate the transmission, for example, of tuberculosis. And in most big cities in Canada, North America, and elsewhere in the world, uh, public health began as part of the city infrastructure. And that was certainly the case here in Canada. Um, and it's still the case in some places, in Ontario, for example, in the urban centers, public health departments are part of the municipal structure. 20 years ago in British Columbia, that changed, and it changed in most other provinces in Canada when uh, the, the provincial governments who were responsible for the delivery of health services reorganized those health services into uh, regional health uh, authorities, and they brought public health out of the municipal structure and urban centers into those regional health authorities. So you can imagine the change. Here were public health officials who included some of our health inspectors responsible for provision of clean drinking water, sewage disposal, air quality, uh, public health nurses who worked uh, closely with city colleagues and brought it into a health authority structure where we were overwhelmingly populated by our colleagues working in acute care hospitals, residential care facilities, some community health facilities. So it became part of the continuum of health services. That was challenging. And I can say that over the last 20 years, there's been some good things that have come from that change, because I think it is important that every, all of us who work in, in healthcare, and we take up in British Columbia about 45% of the entire provincial budget. It's, all, it's important that all of us understand that continuum of care, that we're not focused only on treating people at the end of life or illness care, that all health professionals understand that, that, uh, that uh, disease, illness, and injury can be prevented and can contribute to that. So that was one of the positive parts of the regionalization of healthcare that occurred in Canada. However, what it did do is it took uh, public health out of that municipal <coughs> infrastructure, and for many years we lost some of those important connections that we had with, with, this, with municipal government. Now you could argue that by the 21st century, we already knew how to, to deliver clean drinking water, dispose of sewage safely, we don't see uh, an extremely high rates of tuberculosis in our urban poor anymore. Um, so perhaps there wasn't a need to have public health as part of that municipal structure. However, we do know that the preventable diseases of the, of the 20th and the 21st century are chronic diseases. They have complex origins and they can be very difficult to prevent. Uh, cardiovascular disease, many cancers, mental illness. And it may not seem obvious at first how municipal governments can work to help prevent some of those diseases, especially in a place like Canada where uh, the provincial government has responsibility for health care. Uh, federal government contributes to that and is responsible for the Canada Health Act. But one thing that uh, we've come to realize in recent years, and, and local governments have realized this too, is that the decisions they make 
may have a more profound impact on the health of the population than the decisions we make within the healthcare system or that the provincial government makes around the healthcare system. And that's one of the fantastic things about the city of Vancouver is that the mayor and council, the staff who work there, understand that those decisions are very important and they have a goal of ensuring that the the, that the population they serve is as healthy as possible. But we're not unique in that regard here in Vancouver. And I do, I do want to mention that there are other municipalities within the, the health authority that I work for. One is uh, Richmond. Uh, if you flew here to Vancouver, you landed in Richmond. Richmond was actually the first municipality in our region that recognized the importance of the decisions made by local government in impacting the health of, of their population. The Richmond Community Wellness Strategy, which was established before the Vancouver Healthy City Strategy, and really provided the blueprint for a lot of the work that we subsequently did with Vancouver, but also that has been done around the province. So I want to acknowledge that great work. We've just now been renewing that strategy with the City of Richmond. And there's been work going on in other municipalities in the Lower Mainland, uh, the North Shore municipalities, uh, and, some, and for example, the, the North Shore Congress, which has really uh, had a goal of improving the health of children living in their communities. Uh, some of our smaller communities, as you get outside uh, Vancouver, those of you who may have heard not to Whistler, would pass through the city of Squamish, where they have really, really taken the bull by the, the horns and started to look at how they can develop action plans to improve the health of the population they serve. So the work that we're doing is not unique to Vancouver. It's not even unique to Vancouver Coastal Health that's occurring around the province from British Columbia and across Canada. And for those of you who are from the United States, there are many, many good examples of public health officials working very closely with municipal governments. In fact, the model of having public health as part of that municipal infrastructure still exists in big cities in the United States. We looked at the to example to the city of New York and the great work that uh, the health commissioners there have done over the years with uh, a, a number of different mayors in, in improving some of the built environment to improve population health. Um, in addition to working with local municipalities, we have, um, in our public health group, worked with Metro Vancouver, which is the, the, uh, the regional government that brings together the mayors of all the local governments. Um, we have talked to them about uh, how the decisions they, can make, they make at that level can have a major impact on population health. And one of the things Metro Vancouver is responsible for is the transportation system, and Mark talked about this. Uh, they have put forward a vision for transportation investments in um, Metro Vancouver. This is very important and, and uh, needed greatly. Um, while uh, Mark, uh, Mark mentioned that in Vancouver we know that now we're up to more than 50% of trips taken by walking, biking, or transit for the people who live here. That's not the case in, in all of Metro Vancouver. Our suburban areas are growing rapidly. In fact, they're growing more rapidly than the population of the city of Vancouver, and they're not necessarily well served by transit. Even Vancouver, we are challenged. We have one of the busiest bus routes in the world heading out to UBC that's often overwhelmed. So we desperately need investments in, in transportation. And in addition to working with um, the city of Vancouver and local government, the public health staff who work uh, with me have helped and develop that strategy and help promote that strategy. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we did. And this actually was done uh, with uh, the Mayor's Council at the time when we had a transit referendum. For those of you who are not from here, we were not successful in convincing the general populace that we should be uh, increasing sales tax to invest in local transit. But I think this work is a good example of how uh, public health can better inform some of the decisions of local government. So I do want to uh, tell you a little bit about what we did. Uh, when the mayors put together their transit plan, they, they had a lot of supporters. They had the Business Council of Vancouver supporting them. Uh, people knew it was important that people could move around for economic development reasons. But what, we, what public health experts can bring to the table is those arguments in favor of improved population health. And some may be obvious to, or more obvious than others. I think that most people understand the relationship between transit and air quality. If we can get people out of cars on the road and into transit or using bikes, uh, we're not going to see the same deterioration in air quality over time, especially as we expect um, hundreds of thousands of more people moving to the lower mainland. I think if we go then to physical activity, many also understand that if we build a good transit infrastructure, we improve active transportation because people who use transit 
uh, will, will include uh, walking as part of their daily commute, uh, we improve bypass, people are getting physical activity, and this is important for improve, improving population health. But we could also make the link to some of the things that may not be as obvious um, to, to the general population that can help build the case for investments in transit, like safety. Uh, when we um, have fewer vehicles on the road, we will have fewer injuries. And we know that injuries, particularly from motor vehicle crashes, are the most important cause of preventable uh, disability and death among young adults in Canada. And very importantly, and you're going to hear more about this from the panel, issues of equity. Uh, people who rely on transit are often uh, those living in, in, in poverty with lower incomes. They rely on transit to get to work, to get to school, to get to appointments with their physicians. Uh, so it, it is a matter of, of, of transit as an important tool to address some of those other determinants of health. And these public health arguments may not be at the top of mind when people think about whether or not they want their government officials to invest in transit. So this is part of the expertise that public health officials can bring to the table. I also want to tell you about another great piece of work we did that's helped to inform not only the, the Vancouver Healthy City Strategy, but all the work we're doing with our local governments. And that's a, a population-based survey we did called My Health, My Community. Um, working in a health authority, it's very important that we're able to plan the services that we need to serve a population of more than 1 million people in Vancouver Coastal Health. Local government needs to plan the services for their population. We, get a, we collect a lot of data in, in Vancouver Coastal Health from our hospitals. Um, most of that is illness data. And that may not be all the data that we need to plan for the services that we're going to need in 10 or 20 years. What we really need to understand is the health of the population that we serve. And we don't necessarily have good data about that. And this is true not only here in Vancouver, but across Canada, North America, and elsewhere. We rely on things like the Canada Community Health Survey, which is a survey done by the federal government. Uh, they take a random sample of Canadians and ask them a series of questions about health risks, smoking, physical activity. They also include some measurements of height, weight, uh, to try and produce a picture of the health of the population, uh, risk factors for chronic disease, such as smoking rates and other things. Uh, we have some data from our, our national census that are done every few years. But this data is often insufficient to do really good planning and to understand, the, especially at a neighborhood level or a municipal level, the health of the populations uh, that we, we are serving. So, um, the, the one, one of my staff, Dr. Jack Sandu, who's, who's the regional director of our public health surveillance, surveillance unit, uh, put together a, a survey working with Fraser Health, our neighbors next door, and the University of British Columbia called My Health, My Community. This survey uh, asked, uh, I think, about 80 questions, including socio-demographic questions, health status questions, self-reported health status, about access to healthcare services, lifestyle questions, questions about the built environment, and it was quite unique in this regard, and questions about community resiliency. So, things like, what transportation options do you have in where you live? Can you get fresh fruit and vegetables where you live? Do you know your neighbors? So the, the goal in this healthy city strategy that Mark mentioned about having four people you can count on in times of crisis came from this survey. The survey was administered primarily online, although it was supplemented by outreach because we know to get a representative sample you can't just have a survey online. We worked closely with our municipal partners in delivering the survey because they understood how important this data was going to be in their planning. Uh, it was for adults, uh, it was done in 2013-14. Um, many community partnerships, some incentives uh, designed to make sure that we ended up with that representative sample. And in the end, we had uh, 33,000 respondents. We were able to uh, produce population health reports, and you can see them online, uh, that describe our populations down to the neighborhood level. We've never had this before. With the Canada Community Health Survey, I can talk about the smoking rates in my region, but I, don't, I wouldn't be able to determine what they are, for example, in Squamish or in the south side of Vancouver. So much more granular data. And I'm just going to give you an example of how we've used that data to support the mayor's plan for transportation. We produced a transportation and health report, and here's some of the uh, data we were able to provide. First of all, we, we found that in Metro Vancouver, 43% uh, of residents use active transportation to commute to school or work already. Vancouver's ahead of that, but that's, that's pretty good. 
uh, we were able to, uh, to uh, show that for those who use active modes of transportation, walking, biking, or cycling, they have, they're much less likely to be overweight or obese, 33% less likely. This is important data because it, it's, it demonstrates the value of investing in transit and improving the health of the population, given that we're all concerned about rising rates of obesity and chronic illness in our population. <coughs> We were able to show that people who commuted by active transportation were twice as likely to walk 30 or more minutes per day, which is what public health officials all recommend that you do. And we know how hard it is to get people to be healthy, uh, include physical activity in their daily routines. The reason is because what is part of your routine to use transit to get to work to school, you don't have to set aside time every day to, to, uh, to exercise, particularly important for some of our vulnerable populations. And we also were able to demonstrate that those who commuted uh, uh, and spent less time in their, in their car, so they used active transportation, had more time with their community. And more and more public health, we know uh, that uh, that connection to your community is important for your population health. We're quite concerned about social isolation as a risk factor for poor mental and physical health outcomes. So this data, uh, and it was important in helping inform that plan, but it's not all we did. If you go on the website, you'll see that we produce health profiles for every municipality that we serve that outlines the indicators for that particular municipality. We now, only recently in the last few weeks, have online uh, populated it with a, an atlas that will allow uh, municipal planners or others who want to use this data to drill down and interact with that data. Uh, to, to find out the type of information they might need to help with their planning work. So for those interested about the, the website there, myhealthmycommunity.org, my you can take a look at the great work done by our teams. Uh, so, so, getting back to the Healthy City Strategy. This data was used and will continue to be used to help the city set goals, to inform actions and policy, and to monitor and report on results. So some of the baseline statistics in the City of Vancouver Strategy come from the My Health, My Community report. This is really important because the, the stage we're at now with the Healthy City Strategy is not about uh, setting those goals, it's about what actions. And I've been encouraging my public health team to go back to your municipal governments, now got partnerships with all of them. Now we need to talk about actions and we as experts can help inform what actions are going to give you the biggest bang for the buck. We can help you measure uh, to see whether or not what they are going to be effective. This is a very bold strategy for the city because Many of the actions are not in their control. They need to bring together uh, leadership from other sectors to help address some of those strategies. And that's where I think they've taken the biggest leap, and that's where we can help them. And then ultimately, we'll be able to show uh, the benefit of the work that they do. So that's just one example. I, I'm going to stop there. And at this point, I'm going to invite up the rest of the panelists. Would you like to do that, Mark? <laughs> this is a very interesting group of people. Um, we've got Mindy Pullalove from the Pratt Institute in New York. We've got, we've got Kareem Khan from the Center for Hip Health and Mobility at UBC and Bruce Lampier from Sarge Fraser University. We don't know one another, but I can tell you what we have in common. We are all physicians, so we all trained in the illness care system to take care of ill patients. But we've all taken very different career paths, and the panelists work in areas if different, very, very different areas that have a few things in common. They work in areas that are, are the intersection of how the, uh, the environments we live in and the health of the populations we serve in, in different ways. And the other thing that these panelists have in common is they focus a lot of their research and work on reducing health inequities in the population they serve by addressing some of the more vulnerable populations in our communities. So it's going to be an opportunity for us now to uh, to hear about some of the work that they do and have a discussion about some of that broader definition of population health. Okay. Sorry, can everyone hear me? <coughs> oh, okay. If we get your audio, uh, okay. uh, taking a risk here because these are very tough. When you open them up, on the other side is a white map of the Thank you.
thanks for all the opportunities to be part of this fantastic meeting. I'm a uh, physical activity promoting guy, and Teddy made the point that uh, transit provides opportunity for physical activity, and we like to think of it as a walk interrupted. Now, we saw the data there that people who use transit are very likely to give their physical activity dose for the day, and you only need 22 minutes of physical activity a day to halve your risk of chronic diseases, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease. So that's the big thing. People in this audience are physically active people, we're privileged people to be here, where we know this. But when you're trying to convince other people who don't realise the benefits of physical activity, a couple of things I would suggest are to say, emphasise that the first 22 minutes of physical activity a day are the best bang for your buck. So walking to the transit and walking um, to a meeting will give you this massive benefit and that is as powerful as the famous drugs like the statins and the antihypertensive drugs. <coughs> the effect of those drugs is no better than the 22 minutes of walking in physical activity a day. And if you think, what's this guy going on about? Professor John Ian Eves from Stanford University has published a systematic review showing that that physical activity is as powerful as the drugs for chronic diseases. Okay. And I know that Mindy and Bruce, you work in different areas, so Mindy, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about some of the work that you've done. Sure. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist, and I started off doing research on the AIDS epidemic, but looking specifically at why blacks and Hispanics in the United States have higher risks than whites. And the answer turned out to be that in black and Hispanic neighborhoods, we had had a series of disastrous policies that had both displaced people and disinvested in their this has not stopped. We're still doing the same thing to the same people about CD culture and what we missing. And in this magazine, we put things in everybody's packet, everybody got this magazine. Uh, there's a great article on bicycle equity. And they said that in talking about bicycles, that when people are excluded from being stakeholders in policy making and infrastructure planning, they end up with less safe access to cycling and are in turn denied social gains. The tragic irony of the situation is that the communities who could benefit most from cycling are the same communities being neglected in the planning process. This neglect only inflames and entrenches <coughs> existing inequalities. And this is the huge problem that we face all across the board in health that we come up with good ideas like exercise 22 minutes a day. And what happens is that privileged people say, oh, that's a good idea, I'm going to exercise 22 minutes a day. But the ideas don't get across the whole population. And so the inequalities get worse. So you don't start by saying, okay, I want to do bicycling or walking or make better places, I want to do place making. And, and you can start there, but the second thing you have to say is, and how do I do that in a way that eliminates inequality in the city? If you don't make that second question, you're actually going to make things worse. Not only really for, for the vulnerable, but for yourself as well. Which is why that word inflames is so important. This is a really good article. Read this one. <laughs> I think we'll get back to that point because uh, one of the things we do worry about public health is that with the health promotion work, we are only increasing inequality because those messages, you're right, can get taken. People can incorporate exercise into their daily routine with their privilege. What does a single mother that lives in poverty do uh, when she's up with other things that are uppermost in her mind on a daily basis? So we'll get back to that. But Bruce, I want to give you a chance to talk about the work that you do. Bruce, we'll have to hear from SF here. Yeah. So the kind of work that I do uh, is often quite insidious. Occasionally it gets a lot of media attention, like with Flint, Michigan. Um, air pollution does get more attention. It's visible. We can see it. But most of the things that I study, toxic chemicals from pesticides and PET and lead that we're all regularly exposed to, but we can find in all of us, we have a, a body burden of these chemicals, are difficult to really get our heads around because they're insidious. You don't measure them, you don't know you have them. Uh, and one of the things that I think is probably more important than epigenetics or microbiome, some of the new fads and, and research today, is something that's going to sound quite obscure, but it's related to bike injuries as well. And that is this idea, first, that there's no threshold for some of the most well-established toxic chemicals, from PM2.5 or air pollutants to lead, <clears throat> tobacco, benzene as it relates to leukemia. Not only is there no threshold or safe level, what we see is at the very lowest levels, there are greater harms. 
Now, how does that relate to bicycles? Well, bicycle injuries, when you start putting a few more bikes out on the streets, injuries plummet. There's a steep drop off in injuries. And so what we're seeing in, in public health is this idea that we've got to go beyond this threshold or safe level. Whether you're talking about bike injuries, whether you're talking about deaths from uh, airborne pollutants. Now this idea that these low level toxins can be that harmful is really hard to get your head around. So let me give you an example. Uh, this has also been done some meta analysis, but I'll give you the, the, the stats from Scotland. Following the ban of smoking in public places in Scotland, there was a 15% reduction in preterm birth among non-smoking women. 15% reduction in preterm birth among non-smoking women following the ban on smoking in public places. There was a 25% reduction in preterm, excuse me, very preterm birth, that is children born before 34 weeks. That too is better than any drug. So the kind of work that you're doing is as important, perhaps more important, than what happens inside hospitals and clinics. I'm very glad you ended on that point, Bruce, because these are the kind of decisions that can be made by local governments. They can take and establish smoking bylaws, and I think it's important for us as health experts to explain to them why this is important and the tremendous impact, uh, impact they can have on the health of their population, often immediate impacts in reducing uh, uh, acute heart attacks. Uh, I've read the, the data also on, on preterm labor, and this, our colleagues who work in the hospitals, the cardiologists, really talk about the importance of drugs, and you mentioned this too, Kareem, and, and, and they, they are important, and we don't want to minimize that, but local health officials, when they understand that they can make decisions that are going to have a profound impact on health, that they actually are motivated to do that. It doesn't matter what political party they fit in. Uh, I have found that working with local government, once they understand that connection, uh, and it may not be obvious to them, so they may not know that, uh, that by putting in place stringent smoking bylaws, they can have that kind of impact. They may not know it by establishing childcare spaces, they might reduce mental illness in the future. It's, like it's our job to make some of those connections. So I'm wondering if you can talk about, because I know all of you have worked with many partners outside of the healthcare system, governments and others, in the work that you do. I wonder if you can talk about how you've done that, because that's unusual. Not all healthcare professionals uh, get outside of their offices in which they work and do that kind of type of work. Uh, you were talking to me, Karim, before we started about some of the partnerships uh, of the Center for Hip Health and how you've gone about establishing those. I wonder if you can address that. Great, thanks, Katie. So, uh, I'm from the Center for Hip Health and Mobility, which is a group of researchers and people who engage in communities um, to provide the academic um, evidence and the evaluation evidence to work with um, government groups when we're looking at his activity and we're looking at vulnerable seniors in particular and we've also done work in schools. So people who are at, at high risk and uh, we can make a big difference. So one specific example is I know my colleagues in the Centre for Health and they've got a session on this at uh, 9.45 in Union B, speaking about the benefits of his activity in the built environment. They partnered with the Vancouver government, city of Vancouver, Dale Bracewell, who many of you all heard yesterday. And so they worked on the Cobox Helmington Corridor, and we did a walks along there to check it out, engage the community first and the government. So it was all the different sectors were involved. And then there were physical like benches, and beautiful benches there, and tables and chairs. So and it's a safe for walking, so uh, for biking. So just close to here, Peter Moore, where we are here, there's called the Comox Helmet and uh, Greenway, you can walk up along that yourself, and that's just one example. We're also partnering on the new Arbutus uh, corridor. So basically saying, as people from the university, how can we help different levels of government? How can we be helpful? <laughs> You can talk about some of the work you've done with and, and the places you've worked with local government or other partners. Uh, you, you can address some of the vulnerable populations and health inequities you've worked to help reduce over the years. Probably the, the most important thing that I had a chance to collaborate with people on is, is really is beginning to tell the story of displacement and what it does. I had the opportunity to work with a neighborhood in Pittsburgh called Hill District. Um, which, for those of you who are familiar with the place of Austin Wilson, is the neighborhood that he wrote his uh, fabulous cycle plays about. So it's a, a neighborhood that was affected by urban, all of these planning policies, by urban renewal, by highways, by uh, disinvestment, by gentrification, certainly by the deindustrialization of the city. Um, and then 
the federal government had a plan to demolish housing projects called Hope 6. And that was like the latest round, which was when I met people there. And they said, we, we, we remember displacement because we were displaced by the renewal and now it's coming back. And so we worked together through a series of teachings and a conference over, over quite a few years to articulate what displacement was in their memory, what it had done to the community, and to, to in fact, a story that had never been told, which I then later, they helped me write a book about it, my book was called Root Shop. Being able to articulate what displacement does, to articulate the story, for example, was then very helpful to people in New Orleans after Katrina to say, oh, this is what is happening to us. So um, we are in the process of another cycle of disinvestment and gentrification, and, and bike lanes, as it talks about in this great article, are implicated in gentrification. So it's just important for everybody to understand why displacement is a very, very bad idea for health. If you got a bike lane but you displaced the community, you didn't do good overall. And, and that's what we want to do. We want to do good. So we have to prevent displacement while improving transportation options. Good point. Maybe people might want to address that because uh, as the city embarks on a, on a goal strategy to improve bike lanes, if we talk about transit, there can be people who are concerned about the impact on their local communities. I know where the city of Vancouver is, is uh, uh, having community consultation on some of their plans around bike lanes around heavily used urban corridors where local businesses, for example, are concerned about the impact. Even the Comox bike lane, there was some concern at St. Paul's Hospital about the, the, the patients they serve and whether they would be impacted. So I wonder if you can talk about some of that tension. How do we uh, work with government around important goals but recognize that we have to consider the impact on the broader population and, and address some of those tensions that might arise in some of the work that we've done? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So this is the, the challenge when we have potentially competing goals. Yes. Yeah. And uh, team science will tell us that it's the most important thing is to focus on what the compelling goal is. So if the compelling goal is health in this case, then we just focus on um, speaking to the stakeholders and saying how can we get to that compelling goal and how can we adjust things to allow us to do that. If the compelling goal is transit speed, then you know, we do that, but I think it's about respectful communication with the different stakeholders, and then ultimately people realising that not everyone will be happy, and so that, uh, that there's an equitable process to make that decision. And then having data to base that on, so we're, we hear the right example of some shop owners saying that they feel that their livelihood is going to be challenged. Then the question is, we respect that, we understand that, but what are the data? Because there are also other data that are saying that when there's walking traffic, the shop holders do better, or the shop holders could slightly adjust their um, way they present their material. So let's keep the compelling goal in sight, let's be respectful, and then let's problem solve, because we have a lot of talent at the table. I recall some of our earlier smoking bylaws when we wanted to eliminate smoking from bars. And, and cafes and the, the businesses also said, well, that's going to impact our business work, you know, especially if the neighborhood community is not doing it. And, when, and that's often what experts can provide is that data to show that that's not the case, to evaluate what we do, to monitor, and, and uh, I think that's a really important role for some of the experts. Uh, of course, I'm a psychiatrist, and I haven't found, and this could be because I live in the United States, that people are that rational. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, certainly, you know, as an African American, I don't find that any any of the problems that we do in racism have responded to rational discourse. So the issue is, and, and the intriguing issue for me is, is, what do you do when it's an irrational system? How do, how do you work with that? And so introducing like a real respect, real profound respect for, for the irrational. And certainly in the United States, we're living a moment of the theater of the irrational. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's like reality TV, like what would today's episode be? Um, the, the, and part of, so part of this is that, is that if you have to do this work in partnerships where there's an irrational element of hatred, of historical oppression, of not having everybody at the table, ooh, what you have to say is, so how do, we, how do we do this? How do we get everybody to the table? How do we learn to listen to other people? 
how do we uh, start to have some this this sense that uh, we have health goals, but we can't achieve any of our goals if we don't have equity and equality goals. We don't have everybody to achieve. Um, but this is not that, and you could say that what I'm saying is that this is just rationally say you got to have everybody at the table, but the answer to how you get there is not rational. You have to really move it into the, the, into the border sphere. So I just want to say that one of the great things that bicycle people have done is have mass rides. So getting hundreds and hundreds of people to ride around the city is the kind of thing I'm talking about, because that becomes a theater of liberation, and that is just, and, and there's another article about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so in that regard, one of the great things people could do on bicycles is take thousands of people touring the whole city. So that you don't just go to the pretty neighborhood where there are safe bike paths, you go where there are no bike paths, you go where there are people who are poor, and you get everybody to go with you. Figure out how you get everybody from the whole city to go with you. That would be liberation. It's not exactly rational. Why would a thousand people bicycling to a city that might work? I don't know, but it's the kind of thing that works. Mm -hmm. I was going to just add, it's not a question so much of what's rational and environmental health. Too often, and you just probably saw this about sugar, in the New York Times the last uh, few days, is that um, the way industry has manipulated science, uh, particularly when it comes to things like uh, petroleum and lead and tobacco, is just rampant. And so that's what we have to constantly fight against. So about 10 years ago, um, what I started to do is spend more of my time trying to translate the science through videos uh, and make these videos accessible to the broader public, but especially bombs. Because in the end, moms will lead the revolution to health. Uh, and I, I study mostly how hospitals impact children. Um, there's also a recent collaboration which wouldn't have happened even five years ago, and it's called Tender. And it's about 60 or 70 of us uh, scientists, uh, including epidemiologists, and if you can get epidemiologists to say something's causing something else, Wow, that's just funny. Because <laughs> we're one of the most skeptical bunches, but epidemiologists, policymakers, uh, physicians, and clinicians uh, who've gotten together and said, We know enough. Here are six examples of toxic chemicals that we know enough to act. We don't need to keep deliberating. We don't need to keep doing more research. Of course, you can. No problem with that, but we know enough to act. And that's been a real uh, optimistic sign of where we're moving. When you get scientists to agree, we can hope at least that people will listen. If I could jump straight off the video point of uh, Bruce's, I'm sure Mindy Scott's experience with that as well. Um, the Senator Hip Health made a video called I'd Rather Stay, and it dealt with it. So on uh, YouTube, you can find it just called I'd Rather Stay. And it depicts the story of four different older people with different socioeconomic status. And it makes the point how they want to stay in their home, but the challenges that they face, and it's, it's moving. But it makes the point that it's a much more powerful story than a million journal articles, for example. So that's what I'd rather say. And then many of you will know that you're looking to advocate for physical activity. And I make that as a distinction from exercise. I don't like the exercise word so much because you don't need lycra for physical activity. <laughs> Uh, his activity is walking to things, walking across the road. Uh, there's one called 23 and a half hours. If you Google 23 and a half hours, it's a nine minute video, but the message is clear in the first two or three minutes. You can share it with people. It goes through all the health benefits, including quality of life in a very compelling whiteboard way. And that's had more than five million views. Um, and then I just sort of opened up to social media. You know, Twitter is going well at this conference. And initially Twitter had the view of being of um, the supermodels about things that were boring. Um, that's the gender neutral term, supermodels. Um, but in fact, Twitter is now having a professional community where people are sharing these links about uh, the industry um, manipulating science. And it's a very good way of getting the message out because we have control of Twitter, we don't have control of Fox News. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the journal that I'm the editor of, number one journal in sports science, uh, sports medicine, called the British Journal of Sports Medicine. That has, 20, has 34 thousand Twitter followers, and we have impact with that. We get messages out, and then that gets spread. So um, great vehicles for us to get these messages to all sorts of communities. I, I think I'm going to 
that's great. But one of the things that struck me that many was talking about, and I mentioned this when we, I introduced you, is uh, that issue of, of, of health and equity. And, you know, we have this tension in, in the built environment that governments have multiple goals. And this, in the city of Vancouver, was actually there, the greenest city strategy that uh, was their initial uh, broad strategy. And I think they, one of the reasons why they were sold on the healthy city strategy is because there's a lot of overlap. And often people are more concerned about health issues and environmental issues, unfortunately. So it provides a, a, a great way to achieve some common goals. But they also have an economic development strategy. And in any, um, at any level of government, that would, there, there is sometimes that tension. And I know that some of the work that you do, uh, that you're concerned about vulnerable communities, whether it's exposure to toxins, where people live in poverty, or in certain communities are going to be more likely to be exposed. Uh, you talked about some of the work that you've done with displaced people and some of the marginalized people in urban centers. And uh, you know, how can we make sure that those that the the uh, health concerns of those communities are uh, influence the decisions? And and again, uh, recognizing that tension that governments may have from industry and others. Um, as they're trying to make these decisions. Social media is great at getting our message out there, but even those messages, are they going to be taken up by those communities? And, and what's the responsibility to highlight those, some of those inequities? I think you're suggesting, for example, the biking, the biking to those neighborhoods. So that, uh, but I think maybe you can talk about that in your work, because I think it's something you've all dealt with in the work that you do. One, one thing to be aware of when you think about insidious toxins or toxic chemicals is that they do tend to concentrate in poor communities. Proximity to highway traffic, uh, increased levels of PM 2.5 intensity, uh, older homes that may not be as well maintained, it's going to be lead, uh, certainly smoking in and around the homes, pesticide exposures, all of those tend to concentrate in poor communities. And that's not to say that that's necessarily the only way to resolve those. You can also try to uh, increase the living wage, for example, of communities, give people options about where they choose to live, um, make demands about where they live to get the clean. So I think you can come at it different ways. But the idea that uh, many poor communities are downwind, and that's where a lot of these toxic chemicals will, will concentrate. And one of the things with the, the data that we produced that I mentioned is that we want to be able to, if, if you look at data at a, a very high level in, in British Columbia and Vancouver. We have one of the healthiest populations anywhere in the world. We have amongst the lowest smoking rates, the best rates of physical activity, lowest rates of obesity. But uh, we know that data at a, at, a, at a level of a large population might hide some of those health inequities. So one of our goals in public health has been to, uh, because we are, we're primarily driven by reducing those health inequities, is, is to be able to provide the data that allows us to identify those vulnerable populations. We've been able to produce some data on just on the homeless population from the My Health My Community data, because they were included in the survey. Um, we can, that neighborhood level data will show dramatic differences in the health of communities at a neighborhood level, and it allows um, not only the municipal governments to focus on that, but even for, the, for those that work in public health, some of our staff can begin to focus on some of those vulnerable populations. So, you know, it, it's about using data to uh, help drive some of the actions that we know might be more effective than general health promotion messages and reducing health inequities. And I think what's extremely important is that, uh, and, and this is, you know, again, speaking as a psychiatrist from an American perspective, that the, the basic thesis of racism is that people are different, actually, that there are subspecies, and that uh, if you are in a, the higher in the order, or actually anywhere in this stacking of the races, you don't really, you don't really have anything in common with the other people and their problems are not your problems. And it, it's fun, this, this is an insane set of propositions and believing buying into them makes us collectively insane. And so we have to really begin to, there aren't, there aren't multiple subspecies of humans, we're just all humans. And the social structure of stacking races by preferentially creates an instability in society, this word inflames, it inflames us. Um, but inequalities are not stable, they're unstable. And so it undermines the health of all. It undermines us fundamentally by making us all crazy. And unable to work together. <laughs> Problems that, given in this short conversation, you know, problems of housing costs in Vancouver, 
problems of the aging population. I, I'm at that age where all of my friends, we've all started to fall. Like, wait, we're all falling. <laughs> so we get that thing, I'm falling and I can't get up. <laughs> <laughs> we can't get these points out of the environment. You know, well, why do they have toxic water and points and everywhere else? We need to be able to work together. But people can't work together if they've already decided, I don't like you, we're different, we don't have anything in common. So the real thing about vulnerable populations and about segregation and racism and hatred is it stops us from talking together, from working together, and from solving our problems. And we got serious problems back here. So we need to, that is really the biggest problem. And so while we're thinking, yeah, let's help the people who are in the worst position, none of us is spare the, the evil of this situation. about the parks outside and if you've got a livable good city and we 
know in green space is that affects mental health. We know it does, so don't let's not apologise. And then, the physical activity is as powerful as any anxiety drugs in affecting depression. So I just have to make that point and spell it out that depression is on the list of things that physical activity fixes. And the other thing is that, you know, it's not a cure for every addict, so I'm not making that point. I'm just, but I'm just advocating that this is a much more powerful medicine that people have recognised, and the industry has tried to suppress the benefits of physical activity because they want people to go to the drugs. So they don't advocate and say, well, actually, you know, the biggest single thing you can do for health today is physically active. The second thing might be to take your osteoporosis stroke. You know, they like to confuse the issue, so it must have to balance it up in a small way. Um, I, I want to commend the leadership in the city of Vancouver, the city of Surrey, the United Way, the Canada people who we partner with, because the leadership is pushing against these forces and saying, no, there are going to be these healthy um, programs. We are going to take care of these People. There's no investor saying to take care of the national people. It's, it's the industry that's investing in government and controlling government. So I think kudos to leadership across the region. And I'm just, you know, I think, Patty, if you could comment on the other sectors, because we're moving back to the sector, I think, in, yeah. in this bit. And you do have a perspective from, you know, Surrey would be a fantastic partner with Senator Peter and other, other health regions. Yeah, so, so the, uh, I did want to say it's not just. Vancouver that has this great strategy. Actually, in British Columbia, our provincial government has identified as one of our top priorities in public health, a uh, healthy community strategy. Um, and and it's, it's really driven public health people across the whole province to link with their local governments. And uh, so that great work is going on everywhere. In the Lower Mainland, um, we work closely with our colleagues in Fraser Health, which includes Surrey. We know that uh, in big urban centres, often the people live in the urban core tend to be healthier. The people live in the suburbs that they can use long distances to get to work. Um, the air quality may not be as good in those areas, uh, may not enjoy the same health, health status. So they've done some fantastic work. And I do commend the governments in those areas for recognizing, and it may be more challenging for them to take on some of these important topics. I agree. I think we're, we've, got, we've got five minutes left in getting the, the signal from Mark. So I, maybe if I'll ask everybody to uh, maybe sum up. Um, uh, we've had quite a diverse discussion. We've talked about is it black hippie? We've talked about as how, how health professionals we've worked to improve population health, working with partners, municipalities, and others. Maybe sum up the messages that you would like to leave the group with uh, today. And we'll start. Well, I think um, two, two thoughts. One is. Um, Quite naturally, most of us tend to focus on what we know, our own research. Um, increasingly, I'm shifting to try to think about how do I help tell a story about environmental hazards, environmental health more broadly, which means how do other people's research and trying to figure out how you help people understand that until we start focusing, for example, on community health, we're never going to prevent disease. If we just focus on treating one person at a time when they're sick, we will fail to prevent disease because by definition we wait for them to be sick. This idea of the prevention paradox I think is one of the most powerful concepts out there. If we look at population in Canada, over 10 years um, we'll have about 10% of Canadians develop di uh, diabetes. But we can find those who are very obese, that's about 4% of Canadians, and they'll make up 12% of new cases. Right? So we just focus on the very high risk group, which makes sense, they're three times more likely to develop diabetes. That's the medical model, that's great, right? They're at high risk, but we would fail to protect 80% of Canadians who will develop diabetes. We could focus on the obese and the very obese. That's about 17% of Canadians, it makes up about 38% of new cases of diabetes. Still, we're failing to, pre to prevent the vast majority of cases of diabetes. The only way we can ultimately prevent disease is through population level strategies. Well, building on that, the, uh, for a long time in the United States, the word health has basically got hijacked by the, what people are calling the medical industrial complex, really to mean disease management. And so the, the idea is can we, can we actually like, take back the word health, take it back, occupy health? <laughs> um, so that it's not a synonym for disease, it means health. And then once you start to talk about health, you, 
this point, you can't actually create health for an individual. Uh, a single person, and I don't care how much electric you have or how much you ride your bicycle, you can't make health for yourself or anybody else. You have to, you have to make health collectively to make it together. And in order to make health together, we have to be able to talk to each other. And in order to be able to talk to each other, we have to recognize each other as human beings. And we have to start to listen. So, so, so that's really the, the big task is can we, can we sit down with each other and listen? And, and if we can, then we can really tackle these big crises that are moving. I fully agree with Mimi's points that um, health was hijacked by the industrial complex. And, you know, medical textbook wouldn't have the word health in you know, a 1300 page medical textbook didn't have the word health once in the textbook. So basically, they like to hijack the whole thing as a way for the industry to make money from drugs. So you know, this group is trying to avoid that, and so fully support what you're saying there, Mimi. So at the individual level, the single biggest thing you can do is health. Is so the first 22 minutes are good, and then my secret for those of you that are in this room, just between us, okay, that the public health message is the 22 minutes a day, but that's a public health, that's the biggest thing to give up. But secretly, if you do a second dose of that, so if you were taking a second electricity tablet, you actually get more benefit. That improves your risk of cancer reduction and Alzheimer's and heart attacks by another 20%. So to get the full bang for your buck is actually like the benefits, the benefits level off around 60 minutes. And so I actually did accumulate 60 minutes of physical activity just walking in meetings, um, you know, standing here, yeah, walking, so not exercising. The 60 minutes for a year, 366 days, it was tricky, but you can do it. So you've got the capacity to take care of your health. And then vulnerable underprivileged people, you know, if they can we can try to hold them, that they can do that as well. We don't want them to feel victims of a bigger process, so we need to help people to walk themselves. And someone with chronic COPD, COPD I've been very proud, they can walk a little bit, and the next day they can walk a bit more. So we need to be empowered to take control where we can and get help at the public health level where we can. Okay. And I'll just end by saying that those of us working in public health, uh, we know in Canada and elsewhere in the world that there's concerns about the unsustainable costs of of, of, of our health care system. I don't, if we don't stop it, it will be soon greater than 50% of our provincial budget here in BC. And it, it prevents the government from investing in those other important determinants of health, housing, education, and really health development. We are on, but only about 2% of our regional health authority budget in public health. We can't make change alone. We need to partner with those of you who work in municipal government, people who, planners, who may not have thought that your career would be focusing on improving the health of the population, but there's much that you can offer. So it's about partnering, it's about, as Mindy talked about, talking to one another, it's about realizing we can all bring expertise to the table, and if we create healthy, healthy public policy, and for the investments we make, even if they're not healthcare investments, can, we need to think in every case how they can improve the health of our population. So I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity of talking with these wonderful people. Thank you for listening.